Father, for giving us this day. Thank you for giving us our, our breath. We have gathered this morning that we might offer that breath back to you in praise. That we might lift your name on high. That we might glorify the name that's above all names. It's the name that everyone will bow to. It's the, uh, the name that everyone will call Lord. It's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who took upon the sin of the world that we might become his righteousness. We pray that our hearts and minds are open this morning, that we might hear your word, to hear your voice, and to hear your call on each one of our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So you can see that you can see everybody this morning. Just a couple quick things. <coughs> a lot going on, really, and it's all got condensed in the last couple of weeks. So this Saturday, um, the women's ministry will be meeting. Um, if you need more information, you can get with Sarah after that. I think everybody's probably already up to speed, but that's this coming Saturday. And then... Not tomorrow, but next Monday is the Wild Game Feed. Uh, Mike has a, a list on that back table for all those who, who plan on coming. He's he's asked for uh, if anybody's willing to, to bring a, a side or two. So that's next Monday over at the uh, Wild uh, Old Iron Club at 7 o'clock. Um, also, two weeks is when we have our fellowship lunch. So there's a list on the table uh, for that as well. A lot of signing up. Sign your, lots of signing up to do. More signing up. Our men's conference uh, March the 1st, so I'll take that list. I think we pretty much got everybody. Um, cost is $90 to stay on campus, um, so everybody can turn that in. Maybe by the end of the month, if you need more time, just let me know. Because uh, uh, when, we, when we fill it out, the church has to pay. I think we got eight, nine people um, that are going, so the, the church pays that up front, and then just reimburse the church. So just write the check to the church. If you put in the offerings um, on the little memo line, just put uh, man up. That way we know where that money's going to go. I think that's all we got. That's all the uh, announcements we have this morning. Our scripture reading is going to be from Revelation 5, verses 12 and 13. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Wonderful Grace of Jesus, page 328. Wonderful Grace of Jesus, greater than Chains 
Psalms. Psalm 15. O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart, who does not slander with his tongue and does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord, who swears to his own hurt and does not change, who does not put out his money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be moved. Amen. Have guessers come? Bill, would you lead us in prayer? Yes. Father, we just uh, thank you for this time we have together this morning. And we pray, Father, that you would bless these offerings. Bless each one here. Let's just think of you, Lord, that you watch over them this morning. And we set this down in Jesus' name. We just give you the praise for all that you do. We thank you, Jesus. And let's do this. Thank you. <coughs> this morning, looking at verses 31 to 34. What must I do to be saved? What must I do to inherit eternal life? We saw last week this was the question posed to Jesus, and the emphasis was on the I. What must I do? This was the misunderstanding of many people in Israel and that was one of the main matters of contention that Jesus has with the religious elite, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the scribes, the Sanhedrin, a works-based salvation on one side and then just being a descendant of Abraham on the other side. If you can check those two boxes, then you had it made. If you ask the Pharisee or the rich ruler last week, if they perfectly obeyed the law, what we saw in both of those people is that they would answer boastfully Yes, since my youth, in fact. I'm not like other men who practice sinfulness. I perfectly obey God and his commandments. And of course, this was a superficial reading of the law. And if we're honest with ourselves, when we read through the Ten Commandments, we probably do the same thing. I don't have any other gods before my God. I don't have any graven Im images. I don't take his name in vain. I keep the Lord's day holy. I don't commit adultery. I've never committed murder. I don't steal. I don't cover my neighbor's wife or his goods. Right? Done, done, and done. We're like the rich ruler. What else must I do? Because I've done everything that God has commanded me to do. In Jesus' teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, he completely turns all this upside down. He upside, ups, uh, upsets the apple cart, if you will. So the Sermon on the Mount, Matthews chapter 5 through 7. We can stand up and say, I've never committed adultery. I've never committed murder. Just like these men believe themselves in their own heart. As if the law was a just a piece of stone that we read and check off. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, if you've ever looked at someone else who's not your spouse with lust, then you've committed adultery. If you've ever had hatred in your heart towards anyone else, then you've committed murder because it's a heart issue. Obviously, if you've done these things physically, it's much worse. But if you've committed that sin in your heart, then you've committed that sin, sin has infected us all. So there's no such thing as what must I do to inherit eternal life? The answer is nothing. Our faith is in what he has already done. The writer of Hebrews gives us our 
and a very simple definition of faith in Hebrews 11, 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. That means a confident expectation. Our faith is a confident expectation <laughs> that Jesus has done everything that he says that he has accomplished, and our evidence is not seen. Our evidence is here in Scripture, even though we have not seen it with our eyes, we believe it. Our faith is in the finished work on the cross, that Jesus took upon himself the sin of the world, that whoever believes in him, that means to have faith in him, will not perish, but have everlasting life. As the writer of Hebrews tells us, that he has secured our eternal redemption. So our faith is not in ourselves and what we must do, our faith is in him and what he has already done. This is what he came to do, to offer up himself as a sacrifice on the cross. And as we make our way now towards Calvary, there's other things that happen along the way. He's going to be delivered over to the Gentiles. He's going to be mocked, spit upon, beaten, flogged, and then crucified, nailing our death to the cross. And on the third day, he will rise from the dead for our justification so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. <clears throat> what must you do to inherit eternal life? Repent of your sins and believe this gospel. That's what we do to inherit eternal life. Luke chapter 18, verses 31 to 34. And taking the twelve, he said to them, See, we're going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles, he will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon, and after flogging him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise. But they understood none of these things. The saying was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what was said. Back in verse 31, he takes the 12 aside. So we see we're on our way to Jerusalem. We're almost there. When we get into chapter 19, we're entering Jerusalem. The end is coming near. The days are drawing near for Jesus. And Luke reminds us once again where it is we're going. We're going to Jerusalem. And we're almost there. We know that from the day he was born, from that night he was born in Bethlehem, Jesus has been on the road to the cross. This was the whole purpose of his coming. The purpose of the incarnation is so that he would redeem us from our condemnation by his crucifixion. Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, but when the fullness of time had come, there in Galatians 4, when the time was fulfilled, when the time was filled full, God's perfect timing, in the exact moment in time in human history that God set aside from before the foundation of the world, Paul says, God sent forth his son, <coughs> born of a woman, born under the law. He was born of a woman just like every other person has been born. He was born under the law, just as though we were under the law, except he was without sin. Our sinful nature is passed on from the man, from the seed of the man, Jesus was not born of man, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, yet he was born of woman, therefore he was born sinless. Paul tells us he was born under the law, under God's commandments to obey, and he obeyed them perfectly. Paul says he was born that way in order to redeem us who were under the law. The law condemned us, as we saw last week. God sent his son to do what the law could not do, and that was to save us. The law could not save us. It only condemned us of our sins. But in the perfect timing, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Not only does he redeem us from sin, not only does he redeem us from death, that would have been enough, but Paul says there's more that he has done for us. He has adopted us. As his children, he has given us the right to become children of God. And Paul says, because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. If you've been born again, God has given you the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit within us cries out to him, Abba, Father. 
It's the only ones who can cry to him, Father. God is the God of everyone, but God is not the Father of everyone. He is only the Father of those who have been received adoption through his Son. Paul says, so that you're no longer a slave, but a son. You're no longer a slave to sin. You're no longer a slave to death. You're now a son. And Paul says, and if a son, then an heir through God. Since we're born again and we have been adopted as his sons and daughters, we receive an inheritance. We are his heirs. Our father is a king and he has a vast kingdom. And because he is our father and we are his children, that kingdom, Paul says, now belongs to us. It's our kingdom. And that's where we will spend eternity with him. This is what was accomplished in Jerusalem. This was what was accomplished on the cross. When Jesus said it is finished, this is what was finished. Our redemption was finished. Our adoption of sons was finished. Our inheritance was given. We remember what Paul says in Romans 7, 24 and 25. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? This is right after Paul says, sin has infected me. It's infected my body and my mind and my heart and my soul. All the things I know I should do, I don't do. All the things I know I should not do, I find myself doing. Who's going to save me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul gives us the answer. That's how, that's who. He took the 12 aside and said, we are going to Jerusalem so that everything written in the prophets about the Son of Man may be accomplished. And this is the fourth time since chapter nine that he's told his disciples that he's gonna to go to Jerusalem and suffer. And they did not understand it. They don't understand what Jesus meant by that. And we can understand why. If he's the Messiah, if he is the chosen one of God, then suffering at the hands of the chief priests and the scribes, let alone suffering at the hands of the Gentiles, that's out of the question. Because that's not the Messiah who they thought they were getting. But if they paid closer attention to the prophets, then this is exactly what they would have had been expecting. We're going to look at several scriptures here. We don't have time to turn to each one, so I'm going to tell you the scripture and I'll read it. You can try to keep up. By the time you get there, we'll already be two more scriptures ahead of you. But we're going to look here. There's many prophecies about the Messiah in the Old Testament. There are several prophecies about the suffering of the Messiah in the Old Testament. And we're only going to look at a couple, but we're going to give many cross-references to them. So I'll tell you where they are, and then I'll tell you what they say. We're going to start in Psalm 22. Join us. Turn over to Psalm 22. A Psalm of David. It's the Psalm of Lament, the Psalm of Suffering. The first half, the second half, is the Psalm of Praise. In Psalm chapter 22 and verse 1, the psalmist here, this is David writing this psalm. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In Matthew 27, 46, Jesus quoted this scripture verbatim as he's hanging on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's that moment in time, that moment in human history that the perfect, perfect and sinless one, the holy and righteous Son of God, as he hung on the cross, the sin of the world was poured out upon him. He felt the full effect of the judgment and wrath of God coming against him, crushing him, as he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Still in Psalm 22, jump down to verse 14. I'm poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it's melted within my breast, and my strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. 
So there in 15c, my tongue sticks to my jaws. This was fulfilled in John chapter 19, verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. And this is what John was talking about. Psalm 22, 15, my tongue sticks to my jaws. Verse 16, my for dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. That was fulfilled in all four Gospels, tell us, of the crucifixion. To be crucified, you were hung on a tree, and nails were driven through both your hands and your feet. <coughs> Verse 17. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. Luke chapter 23, verse 35. And the people stood by watching. But the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. They all stood around and stared and gloated or scoffed at him. Verse 18. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Luke chapter 23, verse 34. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. That's Psalm 22. Now we turn over and look at Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53, beginning in verse 1. Who's believed what he's heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form of majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. Isaiah 53, 3. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised, and we dis esteemed him not. That's what's taking place there in Luke 18. Jesus says, the Son of Man is going to go to Jerusalem. He's going to be delivered over to Gentiles, and there he's going to be mocked, shamefully treated, spit upon, and after flogging him, they're going to kill him. Because he was despised and rejected by men. He was a man of sorrows, well acquainted with grief. As one who from men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. John chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. He was in the world. And the world was made through him, and yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. We paid him no attention, couldn't care less about him. John tells us that the one who created the world came into the world, and yet the world did not know him. He came to his own people. His own people did not receive him. He was despised and rejected and we esteemed him not. Verse 4, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. In Matthew chapter 8, verses 14 through 17, when Jesus entered Peter's house, as he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever, he touched her hand, the fever left her, and she rose and began to serve him. That evening they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with the word and healed all who were sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. Matthew says that when he did all things, all those things, he was fulfilling Isaiah 53, 4, that he's borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Verse 5, he was pierced for our transgressions. 
He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. In Romans 4, 25, Paul says, He was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Delivered up for our trespasses. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, Isaiah says. Paul says that's exactly what happened. He was delivered up for our trespasses. But Isaiah also says it's his chastisement that brought us peace. It's his wounds that healed us. And Paul says, yes, he who was delivered up for our trespasses was raised for our justification. When Jesus rose from the dead, he justified us, therefore making us righteous. He brought us peace. It's because of his wounds we now are healed. We've been healed from sin and death. We have become the righteousness of God. In 1 Corinthians 15, 3, Paul says, For I delivered up to you, first of most importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. It's in accordance with what Isaiah 53 has told us, that he was going to come and die for our sins. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 24 and 25. Peter says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Peter quotes Isaiah 53, 5. He sees this as the fulfillment. In 53, 6, we're like sheep have gone astray. We've each turned everyone to his own way. Peter goes on to say there in 1 Peter 1, 2, 25, For you were strained like sheep, but you've now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Peter sees Isaiah 53 fulfilled in Christ. Verse 7, he was oppressed and was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that's led to slaughter like a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Luke chapter 23 and verse 9, so he, speaking of Herod, questioned it at some length, but he made no answer. Jesus is being accused. He did not open his mouth. He did not cry out for help did not cry out and say how unjustified his arrest and prosecution is. No, he stood there silent, <coughs> just as Isaiah said he would. Also in Revelation 5, 6, going back to Isaiah 53, first, 53, 7, he was like a lamb that led to slaughter. In Revelation 5, 6, John says, In between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. He was the slain lamb. He was the lamb that was led to slaughter. Behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Isaiah 53, 7 this was the scripture that the Ethiopian eunuch was reading in Acts chapter 8, verses 32 and 33. If we recall that, he's on his way back to Ethiopia. He's reading the scroll of Isaiah. The Holy Spirit takes Philip the evangelist, places him <coughs> next to this eunuch. As Philip is approaching his chariot, he's reading Isaiah 53, 7, and he asks Philip, is the prophet speaking of himself, or is he talking about another? He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that's led to slaughter like a sheep before his shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Acts chapter 8, verse 35, Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. The lamb that was led to slaughter is the good news. He bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. 
He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him the chastisement that brought us peace. It's by his wounds that we are healed. Philip told him the good news about Jesus. By oppression and judgment, in verse 8, he was taken away. As for his generation, it was considered he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death. We know that Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man, took Jesus' body and buried him in his own grave. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offering, he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many. He shall divide the spoil of the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Jesus quotes this in Luke chapter 22 and verse 37. For I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors. For what is written about me has its fulfillment. Jesus applied Isaiah 53 to himself and said that it will be fulfilled in me numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. For our sake, he was made to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Some coincidence, isn't it? All these things fulfilled. This is this too. This is this Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53. It's some coincidence that these things were fulfilled in Christ. David wrote Psalm 22 a thousand years before Jesus was born. Isaiah lived about 700 years before Jesus was born. Wrote and prophesied Isaiah 53. Some coincidence that all this time later these things were fulfilled in Christ. No, it's not coincidence. It's the fulfillment of divine scripture. Taking the twelve aside, Jesus said, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that's written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. Now we're going to see if we can make some of these things come true. Not might be. Jesus says, We're going, and everything that's written about me will be accomplished. Back in Luke 18. 32 and 33, for he will be delivered over the Gentiles to be mocked and shamefully treated, spit upon. After flogging him, they will kill him, and on the third day he will rise. So this is the first time that Jesus said that he's going to be handed over to the Gentiles, which probably came as a shock to the disciples, even though they didn't understand anything he's saying. Uh, for a Jew to be handed over to Gentiles, that was unacceptable. They had no dealings with the Gentiles. <coughs> Even though they were under a Roman occupation, they're certainly not going to hand over one of their own to these dogs. That's how they viewed them. Back in <coughs> chapter 9 and verse 22, Jesus has already said these things were going to happen. In 9.22, this is right after Peter confesses Jesus as the Christ. In verse 21, he strictly charged and commanded them not to tell anybody. 9.22, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed on the third day, be raised. <coughs> Jesus said that he would be rejected by the religious authorities. Isaiah 53.3, he is despised and rejected. So that's the first passion prediction. Down in 944, that's the second passion prediction. Now here in Luke 18, 31 to 34, this is the third time that Jesus has predicted his passion. He will be handed over to the Gentiles. This was fulfilled in Luke 23, 1. 
And the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate. So this is after Jesus has been arrested. They've now brought him before the Roman procurator, the Roman governor over Judea, Pontius Pilate. They were determined to have him killed. By hook or crook, they were done with Jesus. Even bringing false charges against him. They were going to get rid of him by any means necessary. Paul states this over in Acts chapter 13, verse 28. This is Paul's first missionary journey up into the city in Antioch in southern Galatia. He and Barnabas are now preaching to the people, Paul says in Acts 13, 28. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. He hadn't done anything worthy of death. <coughs> that didn't matter. They still asked Pilate, kill the man anyway. Be done with him. Crucify him. Guilt or innocence does not matter to the unrighteous. When you point out their sin and call them to repentance, you're guilty for suggesting such a thing. When those who live in darkness are exposed to the light, they can either do one or two things. They can come into the light, which God does call those from darkness into light. But many don't want to do that. Jesus says they hate the light because it exposes their sin. So the next best option is to extinguish the light. Get rid of the light, kill it, be done with it, and go about your business. And that's what the world is still trying to do today. That's what the world has always tried to do. Extinguish the light, do away with it so no one can see what they do in darkness. If everyone's doing the same thing in darkness, then it can't be wrong. If they can convince everyone that sexual immorality is okay, or transgenderism okay, or abortion's okay, if everyone believes it, then it must be okay. That's the way the world thinks. John said in John 1, verses 9 to 11, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him, because he was despised and rejected. Then over in chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. The world hates the light. The world hates him. And if you are in him and he is in you, then the world hates you too. In John 15, verses 18 and 19, Jesus says, If the world hates you, know that it's hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. If you agree and you do all the things that the world does and wants to believe, then it loves you because you'll do whatever it says. But Jesus says, because you're not of the world, I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. It hated him and it hates you because now you are the light of the world. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles. He will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise. This was the plan from before the foundation of the world. Before Jesus created anything, this was already the plan. That he was going to have to come and suffer and offer up himself as a substitute for our atonement. Peter says this over in Acts chapter 2. This is right after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. God gives his spirit to the church. Peter begins to preach his sermon at Pentecost. He begins by quoting Joel chapter 2. That this is exactly what Joel had prophesied would happen in the last days. That God's spirit would be poured out upon his people. And down in verse 22. 
next to. Peter says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified him and killed by the hands of lawless men. Peter says, You delivered him up, but this was according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. It means the predetermined plan and the knowledge that God had beforehand. All going according to God's plan. Verse 24, God raised him up, loosing the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. You crucified him and God raised him up according to the predetermined plan. Jesus says the Son of Man is going to go to Jerusalem and he's going to be handed over to the Gentiles and be mocked. Luke chapter 22 verses 63 to 65. Now the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him as they beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept saying to him, Prophesy, who is it that struck you? And they said many other things against him, blaspheming him. Luke 23, verse 11. And Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then arraying him in splendid clothing, he sent him back to Pilate. Luke 23, verses 36 to 37. Jesus is now on the cross. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. He'll be handed over to the Gentiles and mocked. He will be mistreated and spit upon. Mark chapter 14, verses 61 to 65. But he remained silent and made no answer. Again the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, What further witness do we need? You've heard his blasphemy. What's your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. And some began to spit on him, and to cover his face, and to strike him, saying to him, Prophesy! And the guards received him with many blows. Mark chapter 15, verses 16 through 20. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole battalion. And they clothed him with a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. They began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they mocked him, they stripped him of his purple cloak and put on his own clothes on him, and they led him out to crucify him. He'll be handed over to Gentiles and be mocked, will be mistreated and spit upon and they will flog him. Mark chapter 15, 12 through 15. Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with this man you call king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released them, Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. The Roman scourging was a brutal beating. It was a whip that had long strands of leather at the end, and at the end of those long leather strands, they tied pieces of bones and metal to it so that when they whipped you with it, you knew. 
He'll be handed over to the Gentiles to be mocked. He'll be mistreated, spit upon. They'll flog him. And afterwards, they will kill him. Luke chapter 23, verses 32 and 33. Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And he was numbered with the transgressors. And when they came to the place that's called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Luke 23, 44 to 46. It was now about the sixth hour and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. When the sun's light fell, the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. He'll be handed over to the Gentiles and be mocked. He'll be mistreated and spit upon. They're going to flog him, and afterwards they will kill him. All according to plan. And on the third day, he will rise again. Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 8. On the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground. The men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified on the third day rise? And they remembered his words. <coughs> Taking the twelve, he said to them, See, we're going to Jerusalem. Everything that's written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles, he will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon, and after flogging him, they will kill him, and on the third day, he will rise. Verse 34, but they understood none of these things. The saying was hidden from them. They did not grasp what was said. They had no clue what Jesus was talking about. It's easy for us to look back and say, how could they not know? We wouldn't have known what Jesus was talking about these things. Again, in his second passion prediction, back in chapter 9, verses 44 and 45, this isn't the first time he's told them. This is the third time now he's told them this. The second time in chapter 9, 44 and 45. Let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand this saying. It was concealed from them so that they might not perceive it. And they were too afraid to ask him about this saying. Who could understand such things? It wasn't until after the resurrection, of course, that it all begins to sink in. Over in chapter 24, verses 44 to 49, at the end of Luke's gospel, this is after the resurrection. Jesus is now appearing to his disciples, 24, 44. <laughs> He said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, Beginning from Jerusalem, you are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Jesus endured all these things, he says, so that we could have a gospel of repentance for the forgiveness of our sins. He was handed over to Gentiles. He was handed over to sinful men. He was mocked, he was beaten, he was mistreated, he was spit on, he was flogged, and he was crucified. 
in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 10, Isaiah says, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. When we read Isaiah 53, 10, just on a surface level reading without understanding anything else, we, we don't understand how could that be prophesied that God it was his will to crush his own son. To have him hang on the cross, to have the sin of the world put upon him, and have the full wrath and judgment crush him. Put him to grief. It's because it says his soul made an offering for guilt. Isaiah 53, 11. Because he made many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. He took upon our sins, he bore our iniquities, so that many of us could be accounted righteous. Verse 12, Isaiah 53. Because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered among the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. He bore our sin, and now he makes intercession for us. He's our mediator. The only way that we can get to the Father is through the Son. I am the way, I am the life, I am the truth, Jesus says. No one comes to the Father but by me. He is the one that makes intercession for the transgressors. And each and every one of us is a transgressor. Sin has infected each and every one of us. And yet he endured all those things so that we might have a gospel of repentance for the forgiveness of our sins. He did all of this for us. We're going up to Jerusalem and everything that's written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. Jesus says. He's on the road to the cross. He has his face set towards Jerusalem. And when he got there, he accomplished everything he set out to do when he cried on the cross. It is finished. I have accomplished everything from the day I was born until the day I hung on the cross. That's what Paul meant when he says, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In Mark chapter 1, verse 15, Jesus says, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe this gospel. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day that you've given each one of us. We thank you for your son, how much he endured for us. Oh, but for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross, despising its shame. We are that joy. He made his offering for us so that we might become the adopted sons and daughters of you. He endured the mocking, the beating, the mistreatment to be spit on, to be flogged, to be crucified. They pierced his hands and feet, and it's by his wounds we are healed. We pray that if there's one here, if there's one listening who's never been healed, that today's that day that they will repent. He did all this in order to give us that gospel of repentance for the forgiveness of our sins, that if we repent of them, turn away from them, and believe on him. He will take our sins away. They will never be brought up again. He will clothe us with his righteousness. He will give us the right to be the sons of God, heirs to the kingdom. Father, we thank you for that. That's why we come each and every week, that we might praise you for what you have done for us. We pray over this city. How many people in this city are still dead in their trespasses and sins? 
pray for the opportunity that we might take this gospel of repentance for that forgiveness to them. We pray that even right now at this very moment you are softening the ground. It's already being plowed. It's ready to be planted. We pray that the day of harvest is coming. That a revival takes place in the church and that a great awakening takes place in our community. We pray that you will use us for your glory. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. He set his face towards Jerusalem because there were things that had to be accomplished there. And we only looked at a couple. <laughs> Not coincidence. The fulfillment of divine scripture that were written hundreds of years, thousands of years before Jesus was even born. And he came and fulfilled each and every one of them. So that if we repent of our sins, he will save us from him, give us his righteousness, give us the right to be adopted, and give us an inheritance to the, our own father's king. He's our father. We are his children. We have a kingdom that we have inherited. And there are many people here in this community that are going to be on the wrong side of the door, and that shut door. We pray that we can take this gospel to them. Like everybody, please stand. We're going to worship this song one more time. We'll see everybody back Wednesday at 7 o'clock for our study in Exodus, or next Sunday for Sunday school at 9.30 and worship at 10.30. <coughs> Oh
Father God, we just praise you, Lord. We, we thank you that you willingly left the glory <coughs> of heaven, knowing, Father, that you were going to come into a world and face the cross, take upon the cross for the sin of mankind, Lord. We, you, did, you demonstrated the ultimate act of love, Lord, when you gave your life upon that cross. And we thank you for that, Father, and we ask you to be with each and every one of us as we go our own way today, Father, throughout this week. May we, may your Holy Spirit, Lord, reflect in our lives, your Father, to the people around us, that, Lord, that they would see you in us. We just love you, praise you, and ask prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.